to the Bible, Joshua said unto the people, Shout, for the Lord hath given you the city. So far as we know about Joshua as a historical figure, his role was that of a military leader. Uh, symbolically, he becomes a second Moses. In the book of Joshua, when he crosses the Jordan River, he separates the waters the way Moses separated the waters in the Red Sea. But he becomes more than Moses. He is a military conqueror, and he becomes the agent of God in the minds of the Hebrew writers. blew with the trumpets and the walls fell down flat. Was it an ancient biblical story embellished from generation to generation, or did the sensational events recorded in the Old Testament actually occur? The Bible relates that the Israelites were led out of Egypt by Moses in the great exodus. The Hebrews were inspired by their belief in the one and only God because they considered themselves his chosen people. But once they had escaped from Egypt, they were forced to wander the desert for over 40 years. It was prophesied that Moses would remain in the desert, that he would never reach the promised land. According to the Old Testament, Moses died on Mount Nebo. He was 120 years old. The leadership passed to Joshua, Moses' minister. The Old Testament records that the Lord spoke unto Joshua, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise. Go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, into the land I promised to give to the children of Israel. Joshua, his army, priests, and fellow Israelites eventually arrived at the east bank of the Jordan. Across the river lies Jericho, one of the oldest cities in the world. From the beginning, the people of Jericho built their homes in the traditional desert manner. Bricks are made of earth, straw, and water. It was understood that nature would wear away the material, but no matter. It was simple to rebuild their village. Beneath the dry sand of Jericho lies its most precious resource, water, a seemingly endless supply. For more than 90 centuries, tribes, bands of desert wanderers took sanctuary here. They constructed their homes atop the mud brick ruins of their predecessors. By 8,000 B.C., it had grown into a town of 2,000 people. Layer upon layer, they created a record of their time on Earth, one city atop another. What we have left are abandoned ruins as the markers of their passing. It is possible to find in the rubble the pieces of pottery and charred remains of fireplaces that tell us the way of life of those who lived here. Today, this is all that remains of the walled city of Jericho. Yet among the stones, there is clear evidence that here was one of the first advances of civilization. Here, it seems, for the first time, man learned how to domesticate animals and grow crops. It was a major step forward in human development as a nomadic life of hunting and food gathering gave way to a settled life of farming. What was most significant about Jericho, however, was its important defense position as the guardian bastion to the land of Canaan, the promised land. Dr. Gerald LaRue, biblical scholar and lecturer. Jericho as the gateway to the promised land is the first city that a group of people, nomads or enemies, would encounter when they crossed the Jordan at that particular spot. And therefore, it was a defense city. To get into the Holy Land or the Promised Land or to Israel or Palestine, 
you would have to knock off this city, otherwise you'd have enemies on your flank and, and behind you once you passed it by. So it was a very, very important center as a defense. According to the Bible, the people of Jericho were so wicked in their ways that God decided to evict them and to give the Israelites who fled out of Egypt a place to dwell. Joshua would lead the assault. Before him lay the problem of conquering the walled city. This account has been recreated based on the Old Testament. From his camp on the arid east bank, Joshua sent two men across the river Jordan to spy on the city's defenses. It would take them all night to cross the river and reach Jericho by morning when the gates open. Doing their best to remain unobtrusive, the spies made their way to the marketplace where they could mingle with the crowd. But to really get the information Joshua wanted about the inner city and its defenses, they needed an accomplice, somebody who wouldn't be worried about being seen with strangers. They went to the house of a harlot named Rahab. They were made welcome in a manner customary to Rahab. Along the way, the spies had been recognized as Israelites. Within a few minutes, the authorities would be alerted. A remarkable series of events now takes place. Rahab realizes that her guests are Israelite spies. She does not turn them in. She says that she knew the Lord had promised the land. All of Jericho, she tells them, is filled with terror because of Joshua and the armed Israelites. The men behind the city walls had lost their courage. Rahab's little brother spots the authorities and runs ahead to warn his sister. She quickly takes the Israelites to the flat roof. She asks the Hebrews to swear by the Lord that since she has not betrayed them, they will spare her father's house and allow her family to live. The men answer, Rahab, our life for yours, if you don't reveal our business. Rahab explains that the strangers had been with her, but that she had no idea who they were or where they had come from. They seemed anxious to get out of the city before the gates shut. If the authorities moved quickly, they might catch the men before they crossed the Jordan. They would have to hurry. As the day comes to a close and the city gates are shut for the night, Rahab keeps her bargain and brings the spies out of hiding. She lowers a cord through one of her windows. Rahab urges them to hide in the mountains for three days until the authorities returned to Jericho. They could then safely return to the Israelite camp across the water. Joshua awaits news of Jericho's defenses. By the 20th century, Jericho was reduced to mounds of dirt. For over 3,000 years, the evidence of its secrets had laid buried. The, the thing about ancient cities is that they were located always where there were a number of favorable factors. First, there had to be enough natural water to sustain life, either by wells or running streams or springs of water. It had to be in a position where it could be defended. There had to be arable land where they could grow things to sustain life or to nurture their flocks and their herds. And Jericho has all of these factors.
In the 1930s, an Englishman, Professor John Garstang, carried out an excavation which unearthed walls rising to nearly 16 feet, the defenses of a great city. He found that the city was destroyed by a fire which he estimated occurred around 1400 BC. This fits very well with the biblical dating of Joshua and seemed positive archaeological confirmation of the Bible's story. In the 1950s, a second excavation produced contradictory evidence. Archaeologist Alexandra Wilkinson. A bit of circumstantial evidence that was found was a snail shell. And that has been identified as the intermediate carrier of Bilharzia, which is a waterborne disease that uh, gets in through the skin and ancient people would not have been able to get rid of it. And this has a gradual debilitating effect. And the theory is that when the enemy came and blew their trumpets, they couldn't do anything about it. They were just too, too exhausted. Was it disease or was it trumpets that opened the way for the conquest of Jericho? Did Joshua fight the battle of Jericho at all? So far as the biblical literature is concerned, it becomes symbolic. The story of Joshua, the book of Joshua, indicates that the Hebrews came in and in a massive wave swept across the whole of Palestine and, and practically killed everyone or enslaved everyone. But when you move into the book of Judges, you find that they did not conquer this place, that place. There's a whole listing of, of uh, places that stood out against them or were not simply not touched. So the book of Joshua becomes an idealized history, an idealized sweeping across the land, which never really happened. This idealized history was formed, we believe now, in the late 7th century, possibly the early 6th century. And this would be the time when the Hebrew people were taken into exile in Babylon. And they're looking back over their history and they're rewriting it in the context of their new experiences. Jericho lies in an earthquake zone which is never free from tremors. The remains of the walls contain evidence of repeated collapse. The stories from the Old Testament and the theories of archaeologists vary as to dates and type of calamity. Case in point, an excavation of the 1950s led by another British archaeologist, Dame Kathleen Kenyon. Employing an army of Palestinian workers, she dug deeper than Garstang, uncovering layer after layer of cities. One was built on top of the other, spanning a period of nearly 9,000 years, back to the beginning of civilization itself. At the bottom of her excavations, Kathleen Kenyon found military defenses that are remarkable for their period. A five-foot thick wall rose to 15 feet in stone before being topped by mud bricks. A great circular tower still stands 21 feet high. Curiously, it was built inside the city wall. Was this a lookout post against attack or flash flood? Dr. Kenyon realized that a great fire destroyed this city and the site lay abandoned until some time later when a new people moved in from the north. Various tribes inhabited Jericho for nearly 1,500 years. In places, no less than 26 plaster floors were found, one on top of the other. As the city grew, the defenses were extended. A slope was built along the base of the city walls and coated with a smooth plaster to make it slippery against attack. This was the city whose destruction Garstang attributed to Joshua in about 1400 BC. Kathleen Kenyon, however, was using a technique unknown in Garstang's day, radiocarbon dating. By using radiocarbon methods, Kathleen Kenyon found that these early walls were destroyed around 2100 BC, nearly 700 years too early for Joshua. And the second city was destroyed in about 1600 BC, still too early for Joshua. biblical account of the fall of Jericho was probably written some 600 years after Joshua, at a time when the Israelites were threatened with slavery. 
Was it just history, or did it have some meaningful, symbolic purpose? It looks, in a, in a way, like a rallying call at the last ditch to say, look, if you do what God tells you, nothing is impossible. And in fact, in uh, the Joshua story, we're told what the purpose of it is, so that all the Earth's people might discover how strong the hand of God is. This is a story of God interacting with his people. And it's not history, it's not Joshua's diary, the Bible looks like history, but it's more history-like. In 1956, the last year of her dig, Kathleen Kenyon uncovered a most significant find, one square meter at the very top of the hill. Here she found a section of floor with a small clay oven. Beside the oven lay a small jug, apparently dropped and left where it lay. Confirmed by carbon dating, the date fits. There was a settlement here in the 13th century BC. Joshua's story might be history. Imagine what it was like on the day Joshua rallied his people outside the fabled walls of Jericho. Joshua set about rousing his people, reminding them of God's promise not to fail them. The Ark of the Covenant, their sacred symbol of God, would be born before them and would guarantee their victory. After three days, Joshua gave the order to advance to the river. They that bore the ark were come unto Jordan, and the feet of the priests that bore the ark were dipped in the brim of the water. With Joshua's forces approaching, people within the city were filled with fear. Joshua ordered the Israelites to march around the walls for six days silent, except for the priests blowing ram's horns trumpets in front of the Ark of the Covenant. At dawn on the seventh day, the climax came. Seven times the Israelites marched with trumpets blaring. seventh circuit, he ordered his people, shout, for the Lord hath given you the city. people shouted with a great shout and the wall fell down flat so that the people went up unto the city every man straight before him and they took the city because of the cord identifying Rahab's house 
she and her family were spared. The rest of the city was put to the torch. Whether legend or history, or a combination of both, it should be known that the story of the walls of Jericho is related in the book of Joshua and can be found nowhere else. Could the biblical account of the fall of Jericho be true? The fall of the walls of Jericho, if they actually fell, and if this is not simply a legend to explain how the Hebrew people got past this fortress, would be to a group of people struggling in from the desert a miraculous event. Miracles are simply those things that we can't explain by other means. And so people turn and say, well, God must have intervened to make this thing happen. In light of theological points of view and archaeological discoveries, there is considerable controversy to this day. A controversy of ancient beginnings that will perhaps continue until our sands of time run out. <laughs>